It's great to be all of you with you in convention. It's always very special to be with brethren, but especially in Orlando and with us coming from Michigan in the month of March, it's extremely special to us. Um, although we know that the Slavich family and many of you will often head north in the warmer months for family reunions, gatherings, and so forth, I wanted to just take a moment and show that the reverse is also true. This is the Wessel family. They would make a lot of trips north to us in Detroit area. This is a picture of Lenny, Jerry, Danny, Brother Leonard, and Sister Josephine during one such visit. As a family and as brethren, we've been coming to Florida off and on for most of our lives. First trips being to Miami and now primarily to the Orlando area. It's because of these journeys and personal relationships that I was led to provide this service to you today. Please allow me to explain. I began working on this service the day or the evening when our dear sister Josephine finished her course. I was with my mom, Sister Helene, in her apartment when we heard the news from Brother John Traziak that Sister Josephine had passed. I shared the news with my mom, and honestly, I was a little bit surprised with my mom's reaction. When I told her about Sister Josephine, she put her head down and seemed to think for a little bit. She then raised her head and with a slight smile asked me if we could pray together for Sister Josephine and the Wessel family. We did, and it was a very tender moment for my mom and I. We then called Brother Jerry Wessel, and we spoke with him about Sister Josephine. We shared some laughs and some tears with Brother Jerry, but primarily talked about God's plans, his purposes, and most importantly, his precious promises for all mankind, especially Sister... I just saw you guys crying. Um, Sister Josephine. My mom and I continued to talk about my mom's lifetime relationship with the Wessel and the Malia family. I was, I'll get through this. I was especially curious about how she met Brother Anton Fry, Sister Josephine, Sister Carm, and their brother, Tony Malia. All of them would drive up from Connecticut, New York, in order for Brother Anton to serve the Boston class where my mom was a young girl. These back and forth visits continued and eventually my mom would return the favor and visit the Malias and, the, and, the, and, the, and Brother Anton in Connecticut and New York meetings and conventions. So as we like to say so often, those initial, those initial meetings so long ago were the beginning of a beautiful friendship. My mom and I talked for a good hour or so and one more thought to share with you before moving on. Mom also fondly recalled how it was Sister Josephine that was the first to greet her after my mom's immersion at the Chautauqua Convention, Chautauqua Convention in 1947. Towel in hand, endearing smile, and a warm, welcoming embrace. That is Sister Josephine. Blessed be the tie that binds. If you can see that. Yeah, you can see that. Upon leaving my mom's place, I looked up briefly into the evening sky almost complete darkness, and you have to remember this is in Michigan, into that dark winter sky, with the only exception of one bright light that shone off at about 45 degrees off the western horizon. It was not moving, so it was not an airplane or a satellite. I still don't know what that bright point of light was, perhaps the planet Venus, a star, but what I can tell you is when I saw that light, that single light shining so brightly, in the cold winter darkness, I warmly thought of Sister Josephine and all of the brethren that have recently finished their earthly course. A diamond, oh, excuse me, a diamond or diamonds in sky. It was then and there that I asked the Lord for his help in preparing for and serving you today. With that introduction, let us begin with our foundation truth from Malachi 3, 16, 17. Malachi 3, 16, and 17. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him. For them that, for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, 
in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. And again, that's in Malachi 3.16. They shall be mine, the great creator of the universe and the father of the Lord Jesus Christ is intensely interested in his elect. The Lord here refers to his church as his jewels. The most precious of all God's creation is his new creation. The most precious of all God's creation is his new creation. Only his son, his son, his first and only direct creation is greater. Therefore, when out of Egypt, he brought forth a people to be his peculiar treasure, it was not surprising that he used the most precious jewels to picture how precious to him would be the antitypical people picked out for his name. These 12 precious stones, representing the 144,000, were given a place in the high priest's breastplate near to his heart. These same stones were brought from Egypt which represented the world of sin. Just as the retail jeweler displays his gems for earthly sale to the best advantage, placing them in front of a black background, so the Lord's jewels will shine out the brighter to his honor and glory. Seven prime qualities come to our mind when we speak of jewels. First, jewels are rare. I asked John Edmund to help me out. And with the internet's help, we estimate that since Jesus' day, about 117 billion people have walked on this earth. Divide that number by 144,001, and the result is one in 820,000. The Lord has searched for centuries and is still searching to call home his 144,000. Many are called, few are chosen. Number two, jewels are precious. Diamonds are so precious that the top 15 diamonds for sale range in price from number 15 at $29.3 million to number two at $400 million. The most precious of all earthly diamonds, number one, is the Kohinoor diamond out of India, but you'll notice it on the Queen of England's crown, which is now considered priceless according to earthly standards. The, these values are simply a reference to compare earthly jewels to our Lord's jewels. The Lord's jewels are more precious to him than words can express. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. How much more the saints themselves. Number three, jewels are pure. This indeed is the chief secret of their value. The degree of impurity in any stone is the measure of its depreciation. The more pure, the more value. The initial act of their preparation is separation. So with the Lord's jewels, come out and be ye separate. Number four, jewels are brilliant. The only two differences between a lump of coal and a diamond is first, the way each disposes light. The coal receives the light, sucks up, it selfishly keeps it. It thus becomes black no light. The diamond, though, of the same substance received the light, but reflects it back from 100 facets. And the second difference is that the diamond has been subjected to extreme heat and pressure. And we'll talk more about that. To be one of the Lord's jewels, it is necessary to witness to and for the truth to be spiritually. Number five, beauty, too, is inseparable from the jewel. As Solomon garnished the house with precious stones for beauty, so the Lord delights in the beauty of his fair one. Psalm 45.10, Psalm 45.10, declares that the king greatly desires the beauty of those who incline their ear for getting their father's house. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Number six, jewels are durable. Diamonds outlast dynasties. Nothing can impair their luster. Why did not the Lord choose the sparkling dew drop or modest flower to picture his bride? They would picture the goodness that passeth away. The Lord's true disciples must learn to endure. They shall endure forever. The Lord preserveth all them that love him. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. 
the Lord's overcomers. Number seven, the seventh quality of perfection in jewels is usefulness. They're used in boring rocks, cutting glass, setting pivots, pointing watches, and yes, even confirming the love of marriages. The Lord proposes to use his jewels not only to serve each other in this life, but to aid him and all mankind throughout the universe and all eternity. That these seven qualities possessed by the Lord's jewels is shown in our text to confirm they're rare because when the majority are forsaking the Lord, as shown in the previous verses, they fear the Lord and thus provided, proved precious in his sight. They thought upon his name and thus became pure. They spake often one to another, thus reflecting his glory. They were beautiful to the Lord. Even their words were so attractive that God took notes on what they said in his book of remembrance. The text shows that they're durable, for I will spare them, and also useful, as a man spareth not, or as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Jewels of men cannot be transferred from the earthly matrix to the kingly crown without undergoing a great change. Neither can the Lord's jewels be taken at the moment of consecration and given a final place in the glorified body. The perfection of the newly discovered diamond lies deeply hidden beneath the hard earthen crust. After the finding comes the grinding. I like that. After the finding comes the grinding and the washing, and the cleaving, and the cutting, and the polishing begins. All required steps to prepare and present the finished jewel. Jewels have a value of their own, an intrinsic quality, and no doubt would be valuable even if they were plentiful. But their appreciation is all the more increased because of their comparative scarcity. The types and shadows used throughout the scriptures by the Holy Spirit are full of significance, and this one as well as others. When the Lord likens his people to the precious jewels, it signifies that there is an intrinsic value or beauty that he appreciates. And it implies also that such called out ones are, in comparison to the world, very scarce, a little flock. As the diamond in its rough state, uncut, unpolished, would have no more value than any other common stone for ordinary purposes, so those whom the Lord is preparing and gathering as his jewels derive their ultimate value from the cutting, shape, polishing of their characters under divine providence. As it is written, we are his workmanship. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. We cannot expect the type to be perfect in every detail, yet we may, we may readily see that while divine grace is to be credited with this entire outcome, the beauty and grace of the finished jewel, yet nevertheless, divine grace operates according to principles and conditions under divine law. As the experienced diamond miners reject the soft clay and various the hard stones, in seeking for those of the desirable kind, so the great jewel gatherer operates according to a principle in preparing and gathering his jewels. The hardness of a diamond may be used to represent character, and we are to remember that character belongs to the individual and not to God. Each of us, each of us must have our own character, and only in proportion as each has character can we hope to be accepted finally as a jewel? For those without character will not be able to endure the tests. The hard crystallization of the diamond corresponds to willingness toward righteousness in the individual. And unless there be such willingness in the individual, and unless there be such willingness toward God and to righteousness, there is none of the jewel quality which the Lord is now seeking in that individual. Their time has not yet come. Those whose wills are formed, crystallized, set, determined for righteousness are they whom the Lord is now seeking and gathering. 
And here we have the imperfection of the type. For all diamonds are like hard, the great jewel gatherer accepts some in whom the crystallization process is incomplete and helps our infirmities, developing, developing in us by his providences the quality of firmness for righteousness at the same time that he polishes us, Romans 8.26, Romans 8.26. So when the rough diamond has been found, it would be of no value, except as if it would be cut. It is less value than other stones and clay for many purposes. So it is with those whom divine grace finds in the world as having nevertheless will or character desiring righteousness, truth, goodness, justice, a feeling after God, Acts 17.27, Acts 17.27. With regard to righteousness, we recommend the reading of reprint 3735 entitled Blessed the Hungry and the Thirsty and Matthew 5, 6. Matthew 5, 6. Let's read that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Sister Sarah, my wife and I have been trying to do what's right, to be righteous, to be right in every matter means we should seek truth in every matter using God and his truth as our standard of righteousness. Every matter means every aspect of our life, great and small, today and tomorrow. I fall short. Sarah's doing a much better job than I am. All that we encounter, including the information we consume in relation both to the truth and to what's happening in the world, if we seek and love righteousness, we need to be able to recognize it when we see it. Only in familiarizing ourselves with God's righteous attributes of justice, love, mercy, and power will we be ready, will we be better able to recognize righteous when we see it and act accordingly to do the right thing. Let's continue. Oops, I'm late with a slide, sorry. The great jewel cutter, the great leparidist, must really give them all their value by his wisdom and his skill in shaping, cutting, and polishing them. Yet on the other hand, he could not cut, shape, or polish that which, that which did not have the quality or the character, the will for righteousness essential to the receiving of such polishing. Those, therefore, who are in the hands of the great leparidist and undergoing his polishing process must first have passed through the precious experience of having been found of divine grace, found in our Lord Jesus. Uh, must first have been washed and must have been accepted as having wills desirous of harmony with the divine mind. Therefore, they may take pleasure in all the trying experiences and difficulties through which our Lord Jesus causes them to pass as various parts, again, of the grinding and the polishing process necessary to complete, to their completion as Jehovah's jewels, to be made up with the clothes of this gospel age and to be set in the gold of the divine nature, to reflect the beauties of the divine character forever. In harmony with this thought that the apostle encourages us to rejoice in tribulation, knowing that it is working out for us patience, experience, hope, brotherly kindness, love, the various facets of the jewel essential to it in the eyes of him who is shortly to gather his jewels. The apostle again speaks of even the most trying and difficult experiences of the Christian life as being what? Being light affliction. And he speaks of the present life as being in comparison to the eternal future, but a moment saying, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Romans 5, 3, and 5, Romans 5, 3, and 5, and 2 Corinthians 4, 17. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. The Leparidus takes firm hold of the jewel, which he has already tested and proved to have the requisite jewel quality. And encasing it in a suitable instrument, he presses it against the friction, a lap wheel, with just the required amount of pressure, 
to cut away the roughness and unevenness and to affect the necessary shaping and polishing. The process requires great skill. Otherwise, at times, much of the value of the stone might be lost through misshaping. Hence, only skilled workmen are employed in this department. As an example, as we previously mentioned, the priceless Kohenor diamond pictured here in the crown originally weighed in at almost 800 carats. A carat is simply a measure of weight, but in the hands of a poor cutter was reduced to 280 carats. Yet so much of the diamond's value depends on skillful cutting that more than one half of its size was subsequently sacrificed in recutting it to obtain symmetry, beauty, and refractive power. And now it weighs less than 107 carats, although still considered priceless amongst worldly markets. Using this example of the cutting required to give value to the rough stone, how much cutting and shaping has been done in our lives? And perhaps the more appropriate question is how much cutting and shaping is still needed in our lives? And and are we accepting of those cuts shaping by the great Laparitus? So it is with the polishing of the Lord's jewels. Their value depends much on proper cutting. And this is entrusted only to the skilled hands of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom we are assured in advance that he was tempted in all points as we are. That he himself passed through similar experiences of testing and so on at the Father's hands. He knows just what we need to perfect us so that we will be pleasing and acceptable to the Father to reflect and refract the light of his glory when it shall fall, up, when it shall fall upon us in our finished state. A part of our lesson is to have faith in this great master workman whom the Father has appointed to shape and to polish us. We may require much more trimming on some sides of our character than on others. And disposition is often, I do it, is to draw back, to not be fully submissive, to fear that the Lord has forgotten and abandoned us in trial. But infinite wisdom assures us, it guarantees us that this is not so, and that to draw back would leave us unfit for the kingdom. Hebrews 13, five, Hebrews 13, five, and Luke 9.62. Luke 9.62. The earthly lapidary embeds the jewels he is polishing in cement, except the facet or the point which he is grinding, so that neither he nor anyone else sees it during the operation, except as, it, as he lifts it, cools it, and examines the progress of his work. But all the while he knows just what is being done, for he has an instrument called a lapidary dial, which indicates the position of the jewel exactly and avoids the poor cutting of old times. And just so it is with the Lord's jewels, the world knoweth us not. It has seen the world, the world has. The world has seen the wheel of discipline which has been cutting the Lord's jewels for centuries. But it has not understood the necessity and the value of the process. It may even have caught an occasional glimpse of the jewels, but not to any advantage not so as to be able to the real merit of their characters or the value of the cutting and the polishing. For even the already finished facets are smeared and covered with the cement and the slime from the grind wheel. But the great loving master workman and great lapidarist explained it all to the jewels. And they know in part now and by faith are trusting all the remainder singing in their hearts, he knows, he knows. He will not suffer us to be tempted above that we are able to bear, but will with the temptation provide always a way of escape. Yes, the Lord knows just how much pressure to apply, just how much friction is necessary, and will not willingly afflict us or cause tribulation, which he cannot and will not overrule for our good. And being thus assured that all things are working together for good to them that love God, his living jewels can rejoice in tribulation, knowing that it is working out in them the peaceable fruits of righteousness, of love, and that such experiences are essential and that without them, 
they could never be amongst the gathered jewels. Our text, after speaking of the gathering of the jewel class, drops the type of the jewels and picks up or refers to the same class of jewels as God's sons, saying, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. And we have the distinction always held out as between those two who are servants merely and those who are serving sons. Moses was, as faith, was a faithful servant over his house, natural Israel, but Christ is faithful as a son over his house, the elect church, house, family of sons, who have received the spirit of adoption, the Holy Spirit. Although sons, still they must learn obedience, no less thoroughly than if they were merely servants. Indeed, as sons, it is all the more necessary that they learn the lessons of obedience to the Father. More, much more, is to be expected of a son in his father's servants than one who is not a son. He is expected to engage in the service in the spirit of his father, moved by the same impulses of justice and love, because begotten again by that spirit of holiness. As a son, he requires not less careful, but more careful training than a servant, more careful discipline at the father's hands, for is he not his representative and to be his heir? Hebrews 2, Hebrews 12, 7, Hebrews 12, 7. While these sons are not to be spared from the polishing processes necessary to make them acceptable as sons, accepted in the beloved, nevertheless, they are to be spared from something, something our text assures us. Other scriptures show us that this class is to be spared first from the great time of tribulation, which is to come upon the whole world of mankind in the end of the age, in harmony with our Lord's words. Watch ye that ye may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And second, they are to escape the thousand years of judgment or trial coming upon the world which has its beginning in the time of trouble of the time of the end. Thus, the apostle declares that this class of faithful sons, the jewel class, shall not come into condemn, condemnation or judgment with the world. Luke 21, 36. Luke 21, 36. Nor does this imply that the world's trial or judgment will be an unendurable one. For, quite to the contrary, we are assured that it will be most favorable, that the Lord will judge the world in righteousness during the millennial age. But for the church to have share in that trial would mean an extension of the period of that trial. It would also mean an extra thousand years of delay of entering into the joys of the Lord in the fullest sense, a thousand years of delay in attaining to that which is perfect. And not only so, but as we have seen from other scriptures, and as it is implied in this scripture, the class now being gathered is a jewel class, differing in many respects from the world of mankind in general, all, all who have been redeemed. 1 Timothy 2.6. 1 Timothy 2.6. Nor are we to suppose that those who are now pressed against the wheel of tribulation, difficulty, are thereby full of sadness and despair. Quite to the contrary, they realize, as the scriptures point out that they should, a joy and a peace which the world knows not of, which the world can neither give nor take away. And when it is remembered that their severe experiences and polishings are but for a moment, as compared with the longer disciplines of those we dealt with in the millennial age, when it is remembered also that in proportion to their trials and difficulties, they are granted more grace, and additionally, that the reward shall be exceedingly abundantly more than they could ask or think, according to the exceeding and precious promises of the divine word. Then we can see that this house, this house of sons, these jewels now being paired, gathered by the Lord, are truly highly favored above all men and may take well the spoiling of their goods, their earthly goods, joyfully, knowing that these things are but 
working out for their far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In speaking of us as sons of God, the scriptures declare that we are in the school of Christ, the same thought as the cutting and the polishing of jewels. And of those who will ultimately be accepted as sons, they show that they will be such as finish their course with joy, such as will have complied with the necessary conditions. That is, that all who will be of that son class, the jewels, must be copies of God's dear son, who himself is the greatest, most brilliant, and absolutely perfect one. The process of seeking the house of sons, the jewels, and polishing them has already been in progress for almost 2,000 years. And the scriptures indicate to us that now the end of the age is upon us, the time for making up or gathering these jewels and setting them in the glory of the divine nature, preparatory to the new age in which they shall be exalted as the light of the world. The sign of the times clearly indicate in harmony with this that we are at the door to prepare the world for the coming blessing. Hence, we see that we, if we are to be amongst the acceptable jewels, amongst the sons who are striving for the great reward, have need and the desire to give diligence and to cooperate with the great master workmen that the shaping and polishing of our hearts, our wills may be perfected quickly and that we may be ready to share a glorious part when he comes to make up those to make up his jewels, his loved and his own. But glance back at the context, we see another suggestion respecting the disposition of this jewel class during the time of polishing. We read that they feared, they reverenced the Lord, spake often one to another. In verse 16, what a beautiful and encouraging purpose. What could be more natural than a desire for communion with all who are of like precious faith. All who are similarly in the hands of the Leparidus, undergoing polishing, all who are of the same character, the same disposition, as respects to God and his righteousness. Our Lord points out that the love of the brethren will be a marked quality in all of his servant's sons. For he that loveth him that begat loveth also him that is begotten of God. 1 John 5, 1. 1 John 5, 1. And the tendency of the mutual love of the brethren is to meet frequently in person like we are today, via Zoom or through the printed matter or written page, and to speak to other. The Apostle Paul distinctly calls our attention to the importance, the necessity for this class meeting together. He exhorts, forget not the assembling of yourselves together. And so much more as you see the day, the day of the gathering of his jewels drawing nigh. It is to the same end that our Lord has made some of his promises to his people collectively saying, when two or three of you are met in my name, there am I in your midst. There is the thought also that the word together, the sons of God are not merely anxious for a meeting in which the world, the flesh and the devil will commingle. They're anxious, especially for fellowship with each other, with those who have similar characters, similar faith in the precious blood, similar consecration, and who are similarly passing through the hands to the group power to be prepared for association and glory. This desire for fellowship with one another is not selfish, not impropriety. On the contrary, our Lord declares that those who love the light come to the light, while those who love darkness shun the light. And the, and the apostle inquires, what communion hath with light, with darkness? And he points out distinctly that while Satan and the children of darkness may stimulate the table of the Lord and the grace of his truth, yet there is no real harmony or fellowship between their table and the Lord's table, upon which he sets forth the precious truth of his beloved. When we read that these faithful spake together, we are naturally curious about the topic of their conversation the subject upon which they communicate. It is not stated here, but is clearly stated elsewhere in the inspire word. The apostle points out that such mind heavenly things and contrasts them with others of the earth, earthly, who mind earthly things and whose God is their belly, being their fleshly and their earthly desires. 
The jewels conversions, therefore, will not be respecting earthly pleasures, food, arraignment, the ambitions of the natural mind, the pride of life, etc., but will be respecting the things which belong unto their peace, the things which are uppermost in their hearts. For these are all seeking first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness, and in earthly matters are content with such things as they have, as the Lord's providence shall arrange for them. Neither do they come together to lament the trials and the difficulties by the way, although there may be some occasions when the majority weep with those that weep. Usually, however, the proper condition is that in which each should live so in the light of the Father's continence that the trials and difficulties of the present life, which would be terrible and burdensome to the world, who are unsustained by divine grace, will be to these but light affliction. And as children of the heavenly king, instead of going mourning all their days, they will rejoice. Rejoice in tribulation and adversity as well as prosperity. Accordingly, as the sentiment of this class it is written, he hath put a new song into my mouth, even the loving kindness of our God. Psalm 43. Psalm 43. Those who have received this new song and have comprehended its meaning with the saints in general will have in this love of God and, its, in, and in the wide and deep, high and glorious plan of God for the salvation first of the elect church and subsequently of the world of mankind, whosoever will, an abundant theme, a never, a never ending theme, a theme above all others, which will fill their hearts and fill their minds. It will crowd out worldly topics, as being not worthy to be compared. It will crowd out complainings and murmurings as being wholly improper on the part of those who have been recipients of so many divine favors and much advantage every way. In that we have delivered unto us the divine prophecies and especially in view of our adoption into the family of God as sons and joint heirs with Jesus Christ our Lord. If so that we be with him, if we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Romans 8, 17. Romans 8, 17. I'm going to skip ahead just a couple bits. I'm going to leave you with three verses. The first is Psalms 116, 15. Psalms 116, 15. And we read it previously. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Next one, Psalms 84, 10, and 11. Psalms 84, 10, and 11. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather be a doorkeeper of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And finally, we'll just close with our theme text. Then they that fear the Lord spake often one to another, and they hearkened, and he heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. May the Lord add his blessing and overrule anything said amiss. Amen.